I've been shooting in a lot of Hollywood clubs, uh, mostly fairly mainstream, but I've been shooting in the, well, I've been shooting in the gothic clubs and industrial clubs, and upscale Beverly Hills clubs. And this was during the original 902 and L years, so there were some very interesting people wandering around in that scene. Um, but eventually, I got disenchanted with a bunch of that uh, stuff, especially in the Beverly Hills thing, mostly because it was very much a elitist velvet rope, very kind of snotty douchebag mentality, which uh, I think all of you have uh, run into at one point or another. And um, so that was, uh, because of that, I was looking to get out. I was looking for something else. I was, I, basically, I had my antenna of looking for what was coming down the road. What was coming down the road was the re-emerging rave scene, which I had been aware of before. I had seen it in clubbing magazines, you know, and all that. But um, I had never uh, actually attended raves before that. And so uh, my curiosity was piqued because I saw that the rave scene was starting to uh, poke its head above water after being forced underground for almost a couple of years by a big police and media crackdown. And so uh, I remembered all these uh, stories in the press about, oh my god, you know, this what crazy rave scene, you know, it's like, you know, where are your children? Are they in here? You know, <laughs> it was pretty ridiculous, a lot of it. But I remembered it, and uh, so I started investigating. And when I started going to raves in early 96, I understood immediately what the hell was going on. And uh, so I pretty much jumped in, you know, with both feet. And uh, Southern California, which is where I'm from, which is where I had most, did most of my coverage, uh, Southern California became pretty much the center of uh, raving culture, you know, in the country at that point in the mid to late 90s. I mean, the music was all over the place, all over the country, of course. But L.A. in particular kind of became the core for this for a variety of reasons. But the two major ones were, first of all, all the major, most of the major uh, DJs in the world were coming through Los Angeles on a regular basis. So we had no shortage of quality music and quality entertainment. And in that respect, we, came pretty, we became pretty spoiled <laughs> as a result. The other thing is that we had, uh, unlike a lot of other cities, Southern California had no shortage of different kinds of venues uh, to hold uh, a party. Back then, a lot of other cities were restricted. Uh, you had clubs, I mean, uh, raves and stuff in warehouses and certain kinds of clubs, but not much else. Southern California, on the other hand, we had, uh, can we go for it? There we go. Yeah, we had the warehouse type parties like this. This was in a Hollywood uh, club that uh, had about uh, 150 capacity, and on the 4th of July of 96, they put about 350 into there. It was hot as hell, as you can see. But uh, we weren't restricted to this sort of thing. We, were, we had parties in the desert, as you can see here. Uh, and, uh, and there as well, the same party. That was uh, June 4, actually, in 1998. But we also had parties in the mountains. Uh, there was Doc Martin there in uh, 1999 at Gigi Beats. Um, and what else? Here's another one from another party up in the, uh, in the hills north of uh, Los Angeles. And uh, we had, there we go, we had parties on the beach and, uh, and other interesting locations, as you can see. And uh, all this period is what could be called the second wave of the rave scene. Um, the first wave being uh, roughly, there are no uh, exact dates for this, but uh, the first wave being roughly 1988 through 94, and then came that media crackdown that I told you about it right afterward. And then the second wave, which lasted roughly from 1996 to 2004, that's when everything exploded. That's when everything blew up for all of us. It's, the second wave is what made this possible. Um, you know, without rave, there's no EDM. And so uh, it was an incredible, the time period. I mean, it was just such a unique explosion of talent and uh, and also the uh, major production companies or what would become the major production companies like uh, Insomniac and other ones like uh, Go Ventures and B3 Candy, Channel 36, CPU 101. Um, they started throwing great party after great party after great party. Uh, this is when more money was pouring into the rave production companies so they could afford the bigger talent, they could afford to raise their production value. Uh, you know, everything was just go, go, go. It's almost like a you know, perfect storm of everything. And um, as far as I'm concerned, it was a very uh, important and necessary part, or chapter rather, in American pop culture. Very much on the same uh, level as uh, the Jazz Age, 
uh, with regard to rock and roll. Uh, what I really think, though, it's a more appropriate uh, comparison to is the early days of uh, hip hop and punk, where the, it's a very much do it yourself attitude, not just the artists, but the partiers, photojournalists, everybody. So, anyway. Once I got into this thing, that's when I got serious about, uh, really serious about night by photography. And so, um, that's when I really began my photo education. And the reason for that is because this is what we were dealing with here. This is, uh, of course, uh, one of the uh, cameras that I used back in those days. In fact, I've got it down right over here. And uh, by the way, listen to this. You hear that? Those are gears. Those aren't chips. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it was very much an analog world, you know, at that point. And of course, one of the other parts of this analog world is that. Yes, film. That uh, wonderful relic that nobody seems to use anymore. And um, film had a lot of limitations. Uh, and because of those limitations, we photographers had to basically burn that photographic knowledge into our brains. The limitations of film, the biggest one was ISO, meaning film sensitivity. And if you can see here, all these ISOs here are very low. You've got 100 and 400 here, and that was mostly what I was working with in those days. And the reason why is because when you started getting into higher ISOs, uh, higher film sensitivities in those days, you would end up with something like this. Uh, you can see all this grain all over the place. I shot this at 3200 and I think I might have pushed that to 6400 uh, ISO. And that grain is the result. Now if that's the, res the look that you're going for, hey, great, it's wonderful. But most of the rave stuff that I was shooting uh, was not supposed to look like that uh, because it ruins fine details and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, the other, one of the other limitations we had, we were strictly limited in the numbers of shots we could do. We didn't, this was not like the digital era. We did not have a camera with enormous memory cards where we could just shoot and shoot and shoot and delete and delete and delete until finally, you know, we got something. <coughs> that option simply did not exist. And so as a result, we had to be much more economical with our pictures, uh, you know, with our picture taking. Um, and also because of those limitations, we had to visualize a lot more. We had to be able to look at a certain, you know, thing of what was going on there. And we had to say, okay, this is what I want this to look like. Because we did not have the option of playing around with everything like we are today. Now, in terms of the style that I was looking to put together for this, I mean, basically it was because I felt the real need to recreate that incredible rave vibe up on the, you know, on the film. Uh, all that wonderful energy and movement and everything that everybody knows you know, about EDM and about, you know, about raves. Uh, oh, because a lot of the photography that was coming out of the clubs in those days, I mean, it was just boring. I mean, you had no sense of the energy, the movement, the vibe, all of those stuff. Um, a lot of stuff just looked frozen and sterile and boring. And, um, so, um, I had to put together a style that could recreate this atmosphere. And I knew that I had to reach beyond uh, conventional photography in order to do that. I mean, I certainly took influences from photographers that came before me, people like uh, Neil Preston, who was Led Zeppelin's tour photographer for a number of years, uh, Ross Houth and uh, you know, Jim Marshall, other ones like that. Um, but I had to, since the rave scene had so much more than that, I had to bring other elements in. Uh, I took some influences from uh, paintings, or painters rather, uh, very specifically uh, the Impressionists and Post-Impressionists, uh, because they were looking beyond you know, uh, realism in terms of their painting. They wanted to get that vibe, that energy on there. A lot of them had, you know, were, shooting, were painting over water lilies and stuff at the time, but you still had the same idea. Um, I took a lot of influence from science fiction, and I took a lot of influence from anime, and you're going to see a bunch of that anime influence you know, on there uh, later on. Um, and the other reason, of course, is I wanted my stuff to stand out. I wanted people to have to look at my picture and say, oh, that's a Michael Tolbert picture. I mean, every photographer wants that. There we go. Here's one of my techniques that I use. This is two-tone lighting. Uh, this is a very anime-influenced uh, picture. Uh, they use two-tone lighting a lot you know, in there. In this case, I was uh, combining uh, purple and scarlet uh, 
colors. What I was doing was slapping different colored gels on my flashheads. I had multiple flashheads doing this. And uh, here's another example. Uh, you can see I'm using blue and I'm using like a red, reddish orange uh, gel to create. You know, uh, I mean, if I didn't use those and just took a, you know, a regular white flash picture, it would be a nice picture, but it would look kind of boring because it would look like, you know, pictures that everybody else <laughs> was taking at the time. And again, this is just to recreate that wonderful vibe, that wonderful atmosphere that we all enjoyed uh, so much. Um, this is another technique to use, uh, stroboscopics, which is trying to uh, create a squeeze, a very long moment into one frame of film. In this case, that's Richie Houghton up here, this plastic nowadays. This is 1999? Yeah, 99. Uh, in Los Angeles. Um, there's another example, not the DJs, but the crowds. This is a great way to make a crowd look like it's bigger than it actually is. Uh, this room was pretty filled, but I just made it look filled even more. And I slapped a yellow gel on the flash edge to create that. Again, you know, just to make it stand out and make it, uh, do, make it catch more people's eyes. Another technique I use is silhouettes. Uh, this is an old one. Uh, this is another old one. It's from 96 um, in Hollywood. Um, lots of photographers. And none of these techniques are unique to me, by the way. All of these have been done by other photographers. I was just the one who com you know, combined all of these to create this rave, you know, ambience on there. Uh, here's another one, long exposures, where you just keep the shutter open and let the picture almost paint itself. And uh, this is in, also in 99, as you can see the really furious energy, you know, that's going on here. Uh, if you took a conventional picture, you could get something like this, but when you leave that shutter open, you let everybody wave their glow sticks and their batons and everything around, I mean, you really get a better sense of what was really going on. And um, here's another example with the ubiquitous glow stick, of course, another relic of the analog age. Um, and uh, here's one which is just uh, another long exposure combined with camera movement. Here's Mark Farina. Um, this is a very simple one. All they did was put him on one side of the frame, open the shutter, and then move the camera like that to create that motion that, you know, truthfully didn't exist, and he was not shooting across the stage like that. The next uh, thing that comes into it, if you've got all these techniques, how does the process work? Well, in, in terms of, you know, how do you set up a gig? How do you go shooting raves? Well, in those days, I know it sounds like, in those days, back when I was talking about it. Now keep laughing, please. <laughs> um, back in those days, um, it was a lot less formal than it is today. Um, because it was a much smaller community, uh, people had a lot more one-on-one -on -one relationships with the event producers and promoters and the artists and you know, most of the people were just involved in the scene in general. Uh, you, could all, you could call it a great big rave family, a great big self-supporting rave family. As far as the rave uh, promoters go, it was a pretty good match between myself and people like Pasquale and also, uh, you know, Reza Gurami of uh, Go Ventures and Brett Ballow, B3 Candy and a lot of others. Um, these are all guys in the Los Angeles area, by the way. Um, it was a lot easier because there were a lot uh, fewer levels of bureaucracy to deal with, uh, you know, in terms of uh, getting credentials for a gig. It, very often it was as simple as just a calling up the number on the rave flyer, leaving a message saying, yeah, I'm going to show up, you know, is it cool? And then usually the same day or the next day I get a return message saying, yeah, come on down, knock yourself out. A lot different than it is today. And the other part of that rave community, which we're going to get into now, is the next step of the process, excuse me, um, the rave media. And in these days, that means magazines. This is largely pre-internet. The stuff is not going out instantly, you know, over, you know, the wires or however you want to put it, you know, these days. Um, it, was, uh, it was magazines primarily. And guys like this. Bird Magazine, I'm sure lots of you guys uh, remember this. Raymond, are you back there by any chance? No? Raymond Roker, absent, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bird Magazine, Mixer Magazine. Oh, look, Frankie. My favorite color ever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what up, BPM? We got Insider, that's my cover on the right, by the way, um, the Capital Brothers. And um, the major difference between the magazine system then and the digital delivery system 
it is now is that the uh, magazine system was, of course, much slower because you had so many more links in the chain and you didn't have the internet to you know, get everything all over the place. So basically what would happen is, you know, I would shoot a gig and then the next day uh, I would go to the uh, photo lab, ooh, photo labs, and, um, and get the film back and then I would, uh, you know, divvy up, divvy up the shots between my various magazines, I would take them uh, over to those magazines, they would say, oh, these are great, and uh, they would give them to their editors and then they would put the whole stories together and stuff. And so basically the time between the actual shot and the actual distribution of the magazines across the country so that people could read them was somewhere usually between two and three months, which sounds ridiculous today when, you know, the delivery is instantaneous. I mean, literally instantaneous. I mean, if you're streaming stuff, you know, out from the, the middle of a party, I mean, you can get stuff out there live. But, you know, of course, those possibilities did not exist back then. Yes. Do you remember over the course of your career, was there one moment where you truly felt inside out? Oh. This is what I want to do with this. You know, Many times. Is there, is there an underlying mission in the content that you create of what you want to show the Yeah, well, my, my thing, as I said, uh, my mission, as I said back when I was speaking earlier, was to get these things out to the general public, meaning people outside the way uh, thing. My, my goal back then was to have someone outside look at a picture of mine and say, okay, I understand what's going on here, even though I'm not familiar with it. But I mean, I'll give you a great example. One of my first gallery shows that I did uh, back in the late 90s, um, we had the opening, you know, I had a month long exhibition in this place, so we had the opening and then the, the rest is, you know, just the regular uh, clients of the gallery coming. I remember being there one afternoon, and this uh, lady walked in. She must have been in her like, late 50s or early 60s, clearly not someone involved in the electronic music world. And she was going through my material, and she so, and when she was through, she said, I don't you know, know this scene or anything, but I get this. And for me, that was like, yes, you know, mission accomplished. I think maybe one of the ones, and this was a bit odd, Later in my career, uh, well, sort of, this was a few years after I started shooting Rays, uh, when I was at a, a party called Dune in the middle of the desert with about 5,000 people there. And this party at around midnight it had a huge sandstorm came and blasted the whole thing. And, uh, you know, and so once it was over, about like five or six in the morning, people came out of their tents and was getting back there in front of the stage and the sun was coming up and everybody was re-energized and it was just this amazing vibe that went through everything. And when I was taking these big pictures of these big crowds, the, the big crowd right there, I was like, yeah, this is it. This, this is it. <laughs> this is definitely not, you know, a, a pop show. This is not a rock show. This is something more. This is something important. This is something, this is a game changer.